Luke chapter 3, verses 15 and 22. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. The word of the Lord. And you can be seated. This passage, this scripture is one of the most important passages in the Bible speaking directly to the nature of who God is and who God revealed himself to be. There's so many things packed into it. I mean, after all, the most obvious thing you can see in the passage is that Jesus was baptized. How many of you realize that if Jesus got baptized, it's important that we should pay attention that he, was, we, he said we should be baptized too? How many of you know that? So Jesus got baptized here, and then we're told at the end of his ministry, as he was heading back uh, to be with the Father, he said, uh, go now and tell them about me. Teach them about me. Teach them about what relationship with me is all about. And when they receive me, baptize them, get this now, in the name, capital N, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's important for us to understand that dynamic. So, here's the thing. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have received the Lord and you have not been baptized, can I say as clearly as possible, you should be. Not because Greg says so, because Jesus says so. Now, the next obvious question is, well, Pastor Greg, I, I'm a believer in Jesus and I haven't been baptized. When can I be baptized? Great question. We've scheduled a baptism service on April 18th, two weeks after Easter. We're going to get a chance to invite people at Easter services to think about baptism and to think more importantly about what baptism teaches, receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if you are one of those folks out there going, you know what, I think it's time, I've been putting it off, it's time to get baptized. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we're going to have the opportunity for filling out the baptism packet posted on the website. Uh, so take a look at that. Hopefully we'll get it up this week, and that way you can uh, fill out those forms and get ready and prepared for our baptism on April 18th. Now, baptism is not the only thing in this passage. There's this amazing character called John the Baptist. I, I looked around this week for a couple of pictures of John, and quite frankly, I couldn't really find one I wanted to, and this is the one that, that I picked that kind of communicates uh, some of the things I want to get across this character, John the Baptist, was an eccentric character. We're told in the scripture that, you know, he had this camel hair covering, this crazy leather belt, that his snack of choice was grasshoppers and honey, a combination, quite frankly, that I have never considered in my life, <laughs> right? He was the kind of guy, though, who spoke the truth, and he spoke the real truth of the Lord. He spoke truth to power. We're even told in this passage here in Luke chapter 3 that it cost him his life because he spoke against the evil of the king. Oh, Lord, how we need more John the Baptist in our day. Amen? Amen? But you need to know it's hard. It's hard to speak truth to power for that very reason, right? Now, what's even more important than the fact that he spoke truth to power is this. 
John is often called, and I think appropriately so, the last Old Testament prophet. All the prophets of the Old Testament pointed forward to a very important moment in the scripture. It's actually recorded in the book of John chapter one, when John was out baptizing, like we're told here in the scene in Luke chapter three, and he sees Jesus walking down the road, and he points at Jesus and he says, look everybody, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What was he pointing out? Well, it's quite frankly what we've been singing about this morning. It's, it's what we've also been talking about, that Jesus is the one God sent to pay the price for what we did in distancing ourselves from God. You see, the things that we've done in distancing ourselves from God has put incredible distance between us and the Lord. It's called sin. It's rebellion. It's, it's wanting to go our own way. It's wanting to be our own God. And what Jesus did then was he went and took our place on the cross and he died for that sin so that all who believe in him, all who receive him, shall have eternal life. Now, that's not, once again, Pastor Greg saying that. That's Jesus saying that. That's exactly what it says in John chapter 6, verse 47. It's exactly the teaching of the scripture. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, and this John the Baptist he was the one that was pointing at that. Now, you'll notice something else about this picture that I tried to pick. There's a lot of people in the background. One of them's a Roman soldier. One of them looks like a harlot. Uh, the fact about John the Baptist and his appeal when he was doing his ministry was that the rich and the poor came out to see him. The oppressed and the oppressor came out to see him. He appealed to the priests. He appealed to the teachers of the law. He appealed to the average person, and it's because God had sent him to prepare the way for Jesus himself. In fact, John is the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy that people have been expecting, that there would be one, according to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, there would be one who would come to prepare the way of the Lord. That's who John the Baptist himself said he was. He came to prepare the way of the Lord. And so he came, and this moment of baptism becomes a super important moment. We could spend time talking more about Isaiah 40, verse 3, and what it means. We could spend a lot more time talking about all those Old Testament prophets and, and how John was like them, except that John got the privilege to see what all of them had hoped to see. But what I want to focus in on is this intimate moment that the passage speaks about. Ryan, go back to verse 22 in the passage, and I want you to see this intimate moment again. As Jesus is being baptized, the voice of the Father comes from heaven, and the Spirit is descending. But notice the words, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. I want you to think about those words for a moment. Not only is this room filled with lots of people who have father wounds, but most of the people you know have father wounds that have affected them in great, great ways, big and small. Here is an intimate picture of our Heavenly Father looking at God the Son and saying these words that, quite frankly, most of us, if not all of us, long to hear from our own earthly fathers with you. I am well pleased. You belong to me. You're part of my family. You always were intended to be mine. One of the reasons why I think many people have trouble with God and the revealing of who God is is because of father wounds. I could spend a lot of time on this moment about how the healing of a father wound is revealed right here in this moment. Here's the father who sent the son and the son who lived in relationship with the father even when the world wasn't watching. How many of you know that that's what Jesus invites us to? Not just to behave when eyes are on us, but to behave when no one's looking because we love the father. That's what our Lord did. He models for us that that's the way to live, not just to have an appearance of pleasing the father, but to actually please him in word and in deed. And this intimate moment points to something even bigger. 
It points to one of the core beliefs of our faith, something called the Trinity. You'll hear us from time to time talk about the core beliefs that all Christians have, regardless of whatever particular church they might be a part of. If you are a Christian, you have core beliefs. What are they? Well, here's one example of core beliefs. We use the the acronym doctrine to try and communicate it. And doctrine teaches the core beliefs that all Christians share. Whether they're Greek Orthodox or Roman Catholic or Lutheran or Methodist or Independent, if you are a Christian, you believe in what these core doctrines point to. Number one, that Jesus is God in the flesh. That's the deity of Christ. When do we remember that each year? Christmas time. The Word became flesh. Everybody, it's not just a cool time to get presents, amen? We share the presents because Jesus is the present, right? What about the O? We are born separated from God. Because of that original sin, each of us has gone our own way. We're infected with it. And the worst part about sin is that we don't see it. We think we're okay. We think we're good enough on our own. We think we're smarter than God. Which, by the way, goes back to the original problem. The word canon is not a word you normally use, C-A-N-O-N. It means measuring stick. What it's referring to is this unimpeachable word of God that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Core doctrine, this is the word of God. To, to just put it simply, maybe a bumper sticker that you've seen that I've seen, God said it, I believe it, that's it. That's all I need. I've struggled with it through the years, and I've just landed at the same spot. The more I try to debunk this, the more it proves itself to be true. With intellectual honesty, approaching it and realizing it is the most historically established document in the history of the world. Nothing comes close to it. Now the T is what we're going to talk about today, the Trinity, the idea of that God is three in one. The R, the resurrection, that Jesus rose from the grave on Easter, Amen. And that we too will rise who believe in him. But the truth is all will rise. Some to be with the Lord forever if they know the Lord. If they come to Christ. Then you have the I, the incarnation once again goes back to the D. That is the specific teaching that the word became flesh. New life because of the Holy Spirit. And E, end times. And I only say this. End times are on their way. And we might well be in the midst of it. I don't know. Now, that would be a fun topic this morning, wouldn't it be? I'll stick with Trinity. All right, so here we go. What do we, what do we need to know then? Here's my question this morning. What do we need to know about this doctrine of the Trinity? Yeah, what do we need to know? What's important about it? Well, here's the, here's the first thing I want to say. Number one, it comes from a Greek word, and that Greek word is trinitas, and the Greek word means triad or threefold. Now, you need to understand something here. This word is attempting to explain something that our little brains cannot ever comprehend. Can I say that again? We have little brains. How many of you know that's true? Okay. This is actually the wisdom of the Bible, the wisdom of the book of Job. I learned this my very last class in my master's program. It was a good thing I learned it then because it, it helped me realize after all that learning, I still didn't know anything, <laughs> right? Job's complaining to God, whining to God. He's, he's got some reasons. He's been through a tough time and he's questioning God. And then God shows up and says, oh yeah, were you there when I set the world on its foundations and goes through this whole list of things. And at the end of the whole discussion, Job goes, oops. I realize that my brain is finite and your brain is infinite. You realize that when we presume that we know better than God, we are recreating the, the thing that got us all stuck in this problem in the first place. And so God has revealed himself in this amazing way that the little word Trinity tries to speak towards. Now, I just want to say this on the front end of the message. I am not going to try and use a bunch of metaphors with you to try and explain the Trinity. Some of you have heard these. For example, how many of you have heard the, uh, someone attempt to explain the Trinity uh, with an egg? Anybody try to hear that? Yeah, some of you. Whoever that was, flush it out of your brain because they try to mess you up, okay? 
How about the water? Has anyone heard the water example? Yeah, okay. So that, once again, forget that one. Um, how many of you have read the book or watched the movie The Shack? Yeah, okay. So that's trying to explain the Trinity too. No comment. Nice attempt. It falls woefully short. And anytime you use a metaphor or a way to try and explain the magnificence of how God has revealed himself, you're going to fall short. There's going to be some errors in there. And so I've adopted the wisdom of Job. This is what God has said about himself, therefore I accept it. And quite frankly, over the years, I've become very comfortable with the fact that God knows better than I do. Now this is hard for human beings. Because like I said, pride is at the core of our broken spirits. And pride dictates that we deserve answers. And that's quite frankly what uh, Job's problem was with God. And that's why he said at the end of the day, oops, I don't deserve an answer. Right? And so this word is trying to get at something that explains a mystery that God has revealed himself as three in one. Now, why do I say that? Go back to the baptism picture, if you would, Ryan. We, We went past it earlier. So here's a picture of the baptism. Obviously, this is not, you know, no cameras around then, just so you all know, right? This is not the actual picture. Um, Jesus being baptized, what it's trying to capture is that moment in verse 21 and 22. As he's being baptized, the Spirit is descending upon him in bodily form like a dove. I actually steered away from a picture that actually had a dove because notice what the Scripture said, in bodily form like a dove. They couldn't describe it, in other words. So the Spirit is descending on the Son, and here's the voice of the Lord. The Father speaking to the Son, talking about what we already mentioned, that I, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, at the end of the day, who did he really say that for? For us. This was the inauguration, if you will, the revealing of God's plan being put in motion. God said that for us, that we would know this is the word of God become flesh. An important moment. Now, some of you have had people attack the nature of God with you. For example, if you've ever had a Jehovah's Witness come to your door, for example, they've tried to attack your understanding of who God is by attacking the doctrine of the Trinity. Some of you in this room may have even heard a Jehovah's Witness come to your door and say something like this. Did you know that the word Trinity does not appear in the New Testament? How many of you have, apparently a few of you, how many of you have heard that one before? Yeah, they love that one. Like somehow they they think they're going to trip you up. And in a way it does, because you get left with this thing, my pastor never told me that. Right? And a lot of times your, your pastor doesn't tell you these things, not because He's trying to hide something from you, but because we just don't think about all the, th- all the different ways that faith can be attacked. And, and so I want to admit to you, yes, indeed, the word Trinity does not appear in the New Testament. So the word Trinity is not found in the New Testament. And I want to say, just so you know, so what? It's a word that describes something taught in the New Testament and the Old Testament. That the one God has revealed himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a big deal. And it points to, in fact, the teaching of the true nature of God. So the word Trinity describes the teaching found in the New Testament, and I should have said also the Old Testament, regarding the nature of God. Now, I mentioned this already. The air of the nature of God, the air about the teaching of who God is, is as old as the church. You want to know why? Because if the devil wants to trip you up, one of the first ways he's going to try and get you to trip, get tripped up is to plant an idea in your head that the Bible is not telling you the truth. It may come in the form of a new prophet. Like, for example, Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad, the founder of Islam, could not get his mind around the idea of the Trinity, and therefore said the doctrinal teaching of the church, those Christians, was false. There's a lot of people who follow him and believe that. I mentioned Jehovah's Witnesses. I could talk about any number of cults that have been throughout the last 2,000 years 
who have tried to attack this idea, this idea that I should say we believe not because the church told us a long time ago, but because Jesus told us. You see, Jesus reveals who God is, not a church. Jesus says this is the nature of God, not a pastor. A prophet doesn't get to tell you that Jesus was wrong. Can I say that again? A prophet can't come and tell you, oh, the church has been lying to you about the word of God for all these years. Let me tell you what it really meant when actually the word of God, my friends, as I said earlier, is unimpeachable. It's the most verified historical document in history. It hasn't been changed like so many false teachers have said. And so we have to deal with this truth. The most common error that's come through the ages, it's of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and it goes back, like I said, to the early church. There was a pastor named Sibelius, you don't need to remember that, who started attacking this doctrine. And then a church, the church at large, got together and they came up with a statement of faith to try and combat the error. And the error was the error of modalism. The error of modalism is this idea that the persons of the Trinity represent only three modes or aspects of divine revelation, not distinct and coexisting persons in the divine nature. So what they're teaching is, those who believe in this can't get their mind around the one God, three persons thing, so they say, well, it's the one God showing up here is the Father. (coughs) The one God showing up here is the Son. The one God showing up here is the Spirit but it's just one God. Now go back to the picture. Why do we not believe in modalism? Who's present in that moment? All three persons of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was Jesus who said, go and baptize in the name, singular, in the name, one name, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. By the way, some of you have heard a lot of teachings about the names of God in the Bible. Do you know the important, most important name in the Bible is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Because Jesus reveals that the one name of God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is why we don't believe in that error of modalism. Now, there is a big, long thing that the church wrote in the 300s AD, like paragraphs, I went with a shorter version of the teaching. It comes from the Belgic Confession, Article 8. And I just thought I would put it up for you. It says, in keeping with this truth and word of God, we believe in one God who is one single essence in whom there are three persons really, truly, and eternally distinct according to their incommunicable properties, namely Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you ask me to fully explain what that means, I will tell you, I have no idea. (laughs) In fact, one of the most beautiful places I've arrived is just to keep saying that. I believe it, and I don't fully understand it. And it's a beautiful thing, because he's more infinite, more incommunicable, which means unknowable, can't communicate his truth to me in a way that my little brain could understand it. Because quite frankly, if God downloaded to you all of his truth, guess what would happen to you? You would cease to function. How many of you know when your computer gets too much input, it it grinds to a halt? What do you think would happen to you if God inputted his infinite knowledge into you? You couldn't handle it. It's a good thing we have the mystery of the Trinity. Do you see what I'm talking about? Amen. Now, here's the deal. In a lot of ways, everything I've done right now is an intellectual trip. I agree with that if you're thinking that. Why does this matter? Well, here's the fourth thing I want to say to you this morning. The one true God has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if we want to approach God, then we must do so on his terms. Once again, this is Garden of Eden stuff. The greatest error of humanity, if you will, the greatest sin of humanity is thinking we know better than God. And that we get to dictate who we think God is. That we get to tell God how we will approach God. But God is unequivocally clear. If you really want to know the one true God who has revealed himself through the person of Jesus Christ, you have to come to him on his terms. Doing a funeral yesterday. And earlier in the week I had put into this message John 14, 6. And then in the funeral I was preparing the next day. 
Um, the family wanted John 14, the whole uh, first six verses. And some of you know, before verse six, which is this, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Before that verse, uh, the words of Jesus are these. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. And I was preaching to the group, and I was just thinking about that whole dynamic. And, and, and it occurred to me, as I was preparing, that the person who had passed away was a real estate agent. And there was a lot of folks, you know, who were going to be from real estate background and et cetera in, in the room. And so I said, you know, hey, here's what Jesus said. My friends, he said, in my father's house, there's a listing for you. <laughs> but there's only one way to receive it. It's Jesus, my friends, who said there's one way to the father. It's Jesus, my friends, who said there's one truth. By the way, you've probably heard this too. It almost drives me crazy. It's almost as bad as fingernails on a chalkboard, and you younger people don't know what that is. But anyway, <laughs> fingernails on a chalkboard. When I hear people out in, in the world these days saying, well, whatever your truth is for you, my friends, your truth doesn't matter. Jesus is the truth. Amen. He is the way and you got to come to him because when he says at the end of the day, he's the life, there's only one way to have eternal life in heaven with God, and it's through Jesus Christ. It's what Jesus said. This is why the teaching of the Trinity matters so much. This is who God revealed himself to be. This is actually how you go that one way. That the Father sent the Son to die on the cross that the son willingly laid down his life on the cross and took it up again by the power of the spirit. He rose from the grave to pay the price for our sin and to give us the right to eternal life. To all who believe in him, to all who call on his name, they shall, they will have eternal life. Why can we say this? Once again, in the book of Acts, the early church went out into the world according to the teaching of Jesus. And it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, two of his closest followers stood before a group of religious people and they said, I want to tell you something. If you don't believe in the one you crucified who died and rose again, you're lost. Because there's one name given under heaven and earth by which we might be saved. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they believed. That's what the early church believed, the ones who set, spent time with Jesus. They didn't go out preaching multiple ways or false revelation or all this other stuff. They went out preaching the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One of my other favorite verses on this that just teaches to this truth and really dives into this idea is 1 Timothy 2.5, and it says this truth. There is one mediator. How many? And a mediator is someone who could stand between two parties and have standing with both. There's only one person who could ever have standing with God. It's the Son. And he can relate to us too because he was tempted in every way. In fact, we're going to talk about this next week. He was tempted in every way just as we are, yet he never gave in. He knows what it's like to deal with sin and yet he overcame it on the cross. He conquered its effect that all who believe in him shall have eternal life. Why this matters, my friends, is that whether you're watching online or in this room, there are always people gathered at a worship service who have yet to bend their knee and say yes. Sometimes it's because they're still working out the questions for themselves. And sometimes the struggle is real and the difficulties abound. I understand that. I used to be in that moment myself. I used to struggle with things like this Trinity, trying to get my mind around it. I used to struggle with the teaching of the Bible. But the evidence, at least for me personally, became so ultimately overwhelming, I had no other choice. Besides, where else could I go? Jesus Christ is the one with the teachings of the words of eternal life. And so as I exhausted my knowledge... And I exhausted my knowledge and my wisdom. I finally came to the, to the decision. I needed to rely on God's wisdom, not mine. And I needed to stop demanding of God something that he would never respond to, that God come to me on my terms. 
The invitation is for me to go to God on his terms. If there's any of you who are here who have yet to make that transaction, it really is as simple as, Lord, oops, I've been living life like I know better than you. I think I'm ready to accept you as you have revealed yourself. That the Father sent the Son to die for my sin of pride and unbelief. And let's be honest, and a lot of other things that I hope nobody ever else finds out about. Because let's be honest about your sin, everybody. How many of you know you can't even live up to your own standards? You think you can live up to God's standards? And not living up to God's standards is sin. Jesus didn't say, just good enough, or better than the person next to you. I mean, let's be honest. Look at the person next to you and say, if I was measured against you, I'd be okay. <laughs> but if you're in that position where you go, I know the person next to me blows me away, you need to especially listen. <laughs> if you can't smile, what else can you do at this moment, right? Seriously, we... We are talking about the most important thing in all the world, how somebody comes to know and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And so my job is to invite you to believe, to accept the Lord who has revealed himself in this way. I can only point to the one that I had to humble myself and receive as well. We all come the same way. So I'm going to lead a prayer in a moment that I'm going to invite every single person in the room to respond to. For those of you who want to receive the Lord, just pray this prayer with us. I want you to know there's no magic formula. It's your heart humbling itself and recognizing as I did and I've heard the testimony of so many others. I've come to the end of myself. I can't do it. God can. God did it through Jesus Christ and so I guess I'm going to give up and finally receive him. Amen? You can do that right now. For all the rest of you, I invite you to pray with me too. And for those of you who are believers, I want you to pray with joy. I love the old hymn that says, I love to tell the story. I never get tired of hearing about God's grace. I never get tired of hearing that same old story that changed other people's lives just like it changed mine. And it reminds me, there is no name given under heaven and earth by which we might be saved, and that the Holy Spirit is an amazing miracle worker who changes people's minds in the way I never could. It's the Holy Spirit who does that work, my friends. That's why he's amazing that way. So let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. I'm going to lead, and you respond, and let's respond together as a group. And if any of you are out there, either online or in the room, this is your moment. If you want to receive the Lord, we want to lead you to do it. Let's pray together. Lord God, let's do that. Lord God, thank you for re revealing yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For many years, I've wanted to think about you according to my own terms. Because the truth is, I didn't want to humble myself. But I, if I'm honest, I know that I suffer from pride and unbelief. I know I can't even live up to my own standards, let alone yours. And the Bible calls that sin. And sin has separated me from you. And so I've got a serious problem but you solved that problem with the plan of the Father who sent the Son, who died on a cross and rose from the grave to pay for my sin and to give me eternal life. So right now, Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And Holy Spirit, come in and do the work that only you can do. Seal my heart. Let me be born again. In the name 
of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all who agreed said, Amen. Amen.